I'm really excited to be here today to talk about pollinators, which is actually quite fitting because today is the last day of Nas National Pollinator Week. Do you guys know that? Um, I actually didn't know about it until a few days ago myself. <laughs> um, but today I'm going to be talking about some of the postdoctoral work that I've done here at Berkeley. I've been working on it for the last four years. Um, I have not published it yet. This is all unpublished. And today I'm actually sharing some data with you that I have shared with nobody else. Um, not even my supervisor, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, the work that I've done has really been looking at how we can support pollinators in our agricultural fields and, and find that balance of also still getting some economic return. Siligo, silence like science. Silence sil 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 Siligo, yeah. Um, Katie was just asking me, she said she went to you at a talk, and you uh, said you went to a talk and you asked a question about oh, it was a discussion. A discussion, yeah. About, you know, how do you uh, how do you put this this pollinator vegetation into land and, and make it productive so that you can still get money off of it? And uh, this is exactly what I'm talking about, is using crop production and um, of crop diversity as a way to support these pollination services. So I wanted to mention, <laughs> tell you a little bit of personal information about myself, in that I really love living in the Bay Area. Um, here, we have a really unique situation where the general public is almost hyper aware of our food system and the things that we eat and how it's grown. And I myself have tried to become more conscientious Food. So, you know, I go to the farmers markets and I ask questions. I try to go beyond the labels and find out how our food is really grown. And as I spend more time researching and learning, and I spend more time in the fields for my own work, um, and I see how our food, the bulk of our food, is really grown, the more I realize that the problems that we have in our food system are really complicated. They're really complex and they're very systemic. And as I put together the research from uh, the food system with what's happening with the honeybees, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about what's going on with the honeybees and it's not very good, I see these parallels that exist between what's happening to the honeybees and what's happening to humans as a result of our current food system. Since we're so interlinked, <laughs> humans and bees, today I'd like to talk to you <clears throat> about why honeybees, or excuse me, not just honeybees, but why bees and bee diversity are so important for securing our food production. I'll mention um, a brief introduction to native bees, their anatomy and their nesting habits, in case you haven't seen many of these native bees yourself. I'll mention some of the diversification techniques that we can use on our farms to support pollinators, and then follow that up with my strawberry results. Um, and then I'll tell you what happened when I shared my strawberry results to the grower community. And finally, uh, as a result of that, I will tell you what my plans are for future work. So first I'll start with how pollinators are linked to our health. Um, pollinators are essential for our food security. And security is used in other contexts as access to food security. In uh, this context that I use it is about the ability to produce the food in the first place. Um, one out of every three bites of food that we eat are, is dependent on insect pollination to some degree. How many of you have seen, um, there's been on popular media, there's been a photo that's been going around that shows the produce aisle in the supermarket with and without pollinators. Have you seen that? It's pretty uh, dismal. Basically the only thing that's left is a pile of citrus. So I guess we wouldn't have to worry about getting scurvy, but <laughs> everything else would be out of luck. And so it's not just the, the volume of food that we produce that matters, but it's the content. It's that these foods uh, provide us with the diversity for our own diet. They give us the vitamins and the nutrients that they need, or that we need. And uh, so the, pro the, the products that we get from pollinators are things like all of our fruits and our nuts. We get oils from flour and safflower. I was surprised to learn that dairy is dependent on pollinators. Um, and that's because cows eat alfalfa. Alfalfa is dependent on pollinators um, to produce seeds so we can keep that alfalfa production going. 
And then even some of our favorite vices like coffee and chocolate and some spices like vanilla all depend on pollinators. As our global population increases, our demand for food increases, and therefore our demand for pollinators increase. And, and so the problem is that in order for us to meet all of these pollination demands, we're now treating honeybees like just another input on the farm. So just as one would purchase fertilizers and put it out in the soil, now honeybees are being rented and, and placed out in these fields, and they're not always being thought about as actual living creatures that might need to survive beyond that time that's spent in that single field. In our current agricultural production in the United States, we're now using over 2 million hives per year, and they are moved all around the country for that year. I think they might end somewhere in Florida. Don't quote me on that, but they, they're definitely far away from California where they start um, in the early spring with almond production. Almonds are one of the earliest blooming crops that we have. They bloom in February and March, which in the Central Valley is still pretty much winter. I mean, there's not a lot of ground, so the honeybees start there. And then they move, they get moved throughout other parts of California and the rest of the country as they uh, are needed for other crops in other locations. And in this process of moving the bees around, they get stressed out. Um, they're exposed to a lot of threats, including parasites and diseases. They're exposed to a lot of chemicals that can be very harmful to them. And they're subject to poor diets. Usually these bees are placed out in monoculture settings, so they have one crop or one flower type that they get their food from, and maybe some sugar water that could be made from corn syrup. Um, it's kind of like asking us to only eat white bread and candy for a really long time, which will obviously make us very unhealthy very fast. So you can imagine that all of these things would cause the honeybee hives to suffer. And the losses are not getting better. Uh, back in 2007 was the first year that colony collapse disorder was described and diagnosed. And since then, we continue to have record-breaking losses every single year. Every single year, we, um, we outcompete the following year and have, and have more losses. This is a risky business, you know? We are putting all of our faith into a single species that is really threatened and just continues to keep getting hit hard. So how do we shift away from solely depending on the honeybee? I think that we can support and utilize all the other bees that we can find naturally in the wild. In North America, we have over 3,000 species described of native bees. That's 3,000 different types of bees. When we think of bees, we often only think of one. We think of the honeybee. In California, we have over 1,500 alone in California. So we have a lot of bees that we can choose from. We just have to figure out how we can increase their numbers. Supporting native bees doesn't just allow us to put all of our eggs into a bunch of different baskets, but increasing bee diversity also increases the effectiveness of the crop pollination um, services that we receive. This is a graph from a meta-analysis that looked at um, pollinator-dependent crops. So all along the bottom, those are all different crops that depend on pollinators to some extent, starting with almond here. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have beta, which is an, it's basically just an indicator of pollinator effectiveness. The pink dots are all wild bees, and the green dots are honeybees. And for every instance that we have both the data points for, the wild bees either perform as well or outperform the honeybees in their pollinator effectiveness. When you mentioned that you say wild insects, do you really mean wild bees, or are there other insects to it? Yeah, so we, um, that's a very good question. When we talk about wild insects, when I talk about native bees and wild bees, our wild insects will mostly include native bees, but some studies don't decipher between um, wild bees and other insects like flies, which there can be a lot of in the system. Flies can be really great pollinators too. What's the index of beta? The beta, I, um, because this is not my study and this is a meta-analysis, I don't know the math behind it. I just know that this is an indication of, it's basically an, indis, an index for pollinator effectiveness. Okay, good? Great. 
Okay, so we know that native bees can be really effective pollinators on their own, but they also can be great motivators for other bees, such as the honeybees, when they're present. Um, we can use the example of almonds. I don't know if, well, in case not all of you know, almonds are very highly self-incompatible. That means that they need pollen to come not only from another plant in order to make seeds or, or the almond nuts, but they need the pollen to come from an entirely different variety. Um, so when you go out to an orchard, you'll see rows of trees, and every other row will be a different variety. Some orchards will have two varieties, some orchards can have you know, six or seven different varieties. And the reason for that is because that's the only way that they can um, promote outcrossing and actually produce a product. When, they, or when honeybees are left out there alone, there isn't anybody there but them, they can get a little bit lazy and comfortable and they'll just kind of hang out within a single tree, which for almonds doesn't work very well because pollen that stays within their tree does not produce nuts. Then enter Bob. Bob is a native bee. It's the blue orchard bee, uh, known as Bob's in the industry. And the honeybees actually don't like it that much when Bob comes around. It makes them a little antsy, and so they tend to not just stay in that single tree anymore. Now they'll actually start moving between the rows, which is exactly what the farmers need in order for nuts to be produced. So just by having native bees present, even we know they're effective pollinators, but even if they weren't effective pollinators, just having them there present can motivate other bees to basically work harder and increase crop production. In this case, just having one species of native bee is really beneficial, and uh, having more species can be better. Functional complementarity is basically the idea that when the, that different species can play different roles, and when more species are present, you get this additive effect, and so um, you end up having more function overall with increased species diversity. Do the native bees pollinate all? They do. Yep, those blue the blue orchard bees are actually very effective pollinators. And I'll give another example very soon of why that is. Um, so the example that's given here by this paper is that different bees require different weather conditions in order to forage. In this case, bumblebees are actually able to withstand much colder climates and weather conditions. That's because bumblebees are kind of unique and that they have muscles, these special muscles, that when they beat their wings, it allows them to produce their own body heat. Other bees can't do that, and they, just like snakes, rely on the sun to warm them enough so that they can fly. If you're ever out and about, and it's a cloudy day, and it's kind of cold, and you see bees on the sidewalk, it's probably because they're a little bit chilly, and they need to warm up before they can take off again. So in this case, having uh, bumblebees and other bees in, this, in the same field will help provide insurance against variation in weather conditions. The crops can still get pollinated even if you have a bad weather day. Another example is that uh, different bees will emerge at different times. So like the blue orchard bees that are available for almonds early in the season, not all bees come out that early in the spring. So you have some that come out in early spring, some that might come out in mid-summer, and some that might come out even later than that. And if you have all of those bees present, then you can have pollination for an entire growing season, and even an entire growing season across multiple crops. At a smaller scale, um, we get this architectural complementarity. This is the example um, for almonds, again, with native bees and how this makes them effective pollinators. The honeybees, um, they tend to stay on the upper flowers of the tree and the outer branches, just the, sort of the outer part of the tree. Whereas the other native bees don't mind going further into the tree and also the lower flowers. And so by having them present with the honeybees, you get, uh, more, you get more functional pollination. And this can go all the way down to the single flower level. This is a classic example of complementarity. This is a strawberry flower. And honeybees tend to go to pointer. Honeybees tend to go just to the top of this receptacle. So this sort of fuzzy thing here, 
that's where all the pollen needs to go. Honeybees, they land on the flowers and they touch just the top. If once this turns into a berry, this becomes the tip of the berry that you put into your mouth. In order for a full berry to uh, be produced, and a perfect berry, you need pollination to occur at the bottom of the receptacle too. These tiny native bees are really good at tucking themselves down. And sometimes I can't even see them because um, they tuck themselves so far down in there. So having both of them present will give you a more perfect fruit and better pollination. That was just a very brief summary of um, why bee diversity is so important and how it improves our crop production. And next I'm going to show you some of the key characteristics of native bees. I'm going to do this using some slides that were not produced by me, which is why I have the information there. These came out of Harvard and were produced as, a, you can print them up as a booklet, they're observational cards, and it's to be used as a field guide. You can take it out into the field and uh, identify different types of native bees, and they have a lot of amazing photos. So I'm using these slides for two reasons. One, because their pictures are way better than any that I have in my personal collection. And two, because if you like if you like what you see and you think that this is something that you would like to have, um, you can then access the full version later at the Ecology of Life, or excuse me, the Encyclopedia of Life website that's listed here. So we'll start just with some basic bee anatomy. Uh, bees are insects, and like all insects, they have the same three main body parts, the head, the thorax, which is the middle, and the abdomen. Um, the key distinguishing features of bees versus other insects are they have four wings. Um, they have their eyes that are sort of on the side of their heads. They have longer antennae, usually. Um, they have chewing mouth parts. This particular bee is very hairy that's presented here, but that's not a distinguishing feature. Some bees are practically hairless um, and look a lot like flies. So that's not the best way to identify them. And something interesting that I found out and was actually quite pleased to find out is that only females sting. Only females have stingers. And that's because the stinger is actually a modified structure of the ovipositor that they use to lay their eggs. Very interesting, right? And there are a lot of different insects out there that look just like bees. And when we, when I, it's funny, when we think about lookalikes, these all kind of look like the honeybee to me. Again, because really there are so many native bees out there that look nothing like the honeybee. But in this case, um, mostly wasps and flies look a lot like bees. So in panel, or uh, image one, that's the wasp. The difference between wasps and honeybees is not the number of wings. They, wasps and uh, bees are in the same family. The difference is that wasps tend to even kind of look meaner. And that's because, you know, they have a harder armor. Their exoskeletons are much more hardened for protection. They're usually brightly colored, a lot of contrast between the dark and light colors. And <clears throat> the color actually comes from the exoskeleton itself. That's colored. Whereas with bees, for the most part, their coloration does not come from their skin. It comes from hairs that are colored. Um, so that's a major difference. Uh, two, three, four, and five are all flies. I thought that two must have been some sort of cuckoo bee or a bumblebee, but it's actually a robber fly that has caught and is eating a honeybee there. So the difference between the main difference between bees and flies is the number of wings. Flies are in the uh, family Diptera, or the the order Diptera, <laughs> excuse me, and that means dying means two. So they have two wings. And um, flies can also be extremely hairy, just like that one in number two, and hairier than a lot of even the hairiest bees. So that's also not a good key distinguishing factor. But you can see that here the eyes wrap around almost their entire heads. Uh, whereas the honeybee, or I keep saying honeybees, but bees have them on the sides of their heads. Also, t uh, three, four, and five are all hoverflies in the surfid family. And those are the flies that I mentioned are actually really good pollinators that we find in the wild too. But the flight behavior is very different from bees. 
hoverflies can actually stay in one place, kind of like a helicopter. Um, so they might zip and then stay in a place and zip and then stay in a place. You will never find anything that does that because they don't have the ability to balance and stay in one place like that. So um, that's kind of a key <coughs> indicator to see a flying around and you can't count the number of wings that it has. If it's hovering, it's not a bee. And the last one is this really, um, really interesting creature. It's a moth. This is a clear-winged moth, a hummingbird moth. And I saw one of these recently in Tahoe, in an alpine meadow. And at first glance, I thought it, I totally thought it was a bumblebee, but it is a moth. Um, so that was pretty fascinating. Within the native bees, they span an immense range of size and shape. They can be as small as just a couple millimeters in length, kind of like the ones that I had shown for the strawberry pollination, all the way up to queen bumblebees that can be you know, an inch in length. When they fly by your head, they sound just like a helicopter, and they can fulfill the function of um, birds for some, for some bird pollinated flowers. Do you have a question? Yeah? Okay. Um, yes. Where the bees carry their pollen can actually be really important in determining their effectiveness as pollinators. Not all bees fit every single flower in the same way. Honeybees and bumblebees put their pollen into baskets called corbicula. Um, you can see that round ball up there. Basically what they do is when they're out foraging for nectar and or pollen, and they get pollen on their bodies, they'll groom themselves and then they mix that with some nectar that they regurgitate and they make it into this kind of pasty play-doh type substance that they then shove down into their pockets like that. Once they get into those pollen baskets, that pollen is not available to pollinate any other plants. So it's just when the pollen is on their bodies that they're really good pollinators. Other native bees, all other native bees, um, carry their pollen on their body by means of hairs, they don't have those baskets. So in number two, you can see that's a hairy belly bee, and you can see all that pollen that's just packed onto its underside. Versus over here, we have the hairy leg bees, and you can see all this pollen that's more on the side of its body. And then in number four, this is the most primitive genus of bee, Hylaeus. Um, these are the bees that we find in the Pacific Islands, like Hawaii and New Zealand. And they carry pollen they ingest it and they carry it in a crop. And then when they get back to their nest, they regurgitate it. So as pollinators, you can see it's also very smooth body. It doesn't have a lot of hairs. So it's not going to carry a lot of hair on the outside of its body. Um, so they tend to not be as effective pollinators as these guys. But if there are a lot of them and there's nothing else around, they'll do the job. There are two types of sociality. Well, there are two general types of sociality um, that we can put bees into, and it affects their behavior and their nesting habits. Honeybees and bumblebees are considered social bees, which means that they make nests that house one queen and a lot of different workers. The difference between honeybees and bumblebees is that honeybee nests or hives um, will persist for several years if they're healthy. They can persist for several years and they can have thousands of bees, um, worker bees, to one queen. Bumblebee nests are a lot smaller and they only last for one year. Bumblebees are annuals. They, they die off after one year. Honeybees are the only bees that make honey, hence the name honeybees. Um, bumblebees can make something similar but nothing to the extent down there in the corner, you can see those are nectar pots, um, but they can't be harvested commercially for, for honey like the honey because. The majority of our native bees are all solitary bees. That means that one nest equals one female, and that female tends to that nest by herself. And most of our solitary bees are all ground nesting. They make their, they burrow holes into the ground for their nests. Some of the uh, native bees will make nests in wood, so uh, in dead wood and branches or even stems of some weedy plants. This is really important to think about because 
I feel like when we think about bees, we often think about, especially honeybees, we often think about them being in these big hives or nests that could be potentially off of agricultural fields. So when we're out there and we're putting spray in fields, we're actually spraying the nests too. And we think that because we don't see the bees, they're not there. But particularly for the majority of our native bees, that's just not the case. So how do we increase the number of native bees? You know, the short answer is that we just have to improve their food and nesting resources. As we have intensified agriculture for our current food system, we've done a really good job of wiping out a lot of the food sources that they've been using and contaminating their nesting sources and disturbing them with um, practices of very deep tilling where we just shred up that soil and dig up all of those nests. So in order to bring the bees back, we have to put those plants that feed them back into the fields, and we have to provide them with a safe, chemical-free uh, place to nest. These are some, te some techniques that we can use to diversify farm fields in order to support pollinators and also other ecosystem services. These techniques follow along the spatial gradient, spatial scale gradient, from the plot level down here, plot or field level, um, all the way up to a landscape level where we're talking about far, uh, natural habitat that can surround farms at very large scales. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you some pictures of these in case not everybody is familiar with what these terms are. First we have insectary strips, and I have two examples. This one here, insect, insectary strips are also called floral strips or floral rows. And uh, usually they're put in to promote natural enemies to pests, like this here. The white one, this is sweet alyssum. And then the one over there, that's, uh, more, that has more diversity of four resources to support pollinators. Cover crops are grown in order to improve soil conditions. They're usually grown in areas that would normally lay fallow for the winter, which means nothing else is planted there, it would just be bare soil. This picture here shows you a cover crop in three different stages. Um, where the cover crop is grown here to when it's been cut back and let dry and now it's being tilled into the soil. Cover crops, uh, <coughs> the mix will often consist of grasses like rye or wheat, um, some nitrogen producing <coughs> plants like sweet pea, um, and then brassicas like wild mustard and they will disinfest the soil and get rid of some diseases. Exactly. That's exactly it. And you know, this is a really this is a picture of a very large scale cover crop. Some people will consider cover crops as those that are placed in between rows, like in orchards, um, just any any land that would normally be bare, and is now covered by having these crops in that place. Is there a commercial use of crops? Usually not. Usually it's put in as a soil amendment um, and to help prevent soil erosion and then it gets tilled back in to the soil. Multi-cropping is also called polyculture um, or crop diversity, which are the two terms that I will continue to use throughout this talk. You can see here that there are uh, a lot of different crops grown in this relatively small area. And over there is just an example of, that's soybeans and sunflower that are being um, grown with each other instead of having two separate blocks of, of them in a large field. Many of you might be familiar with the term hedgerows. They've been really talked up in the media, especially in the context of building pollinator communities. And those hedgerows that are placed to support pollinators often consist of perennial shrubs that are native, um, and will provide food and nesting sources for the majority of the year. Riparian corridors act as a really good buffer between agriculture land and our water sources. They are pretty much like a filter when we have runoff from those fields. It can sort of help improve water quality before it hits those uh, rivers and water sources. They can also help prevent flooding to a certain extent. And then the last one, nature reserves. I feel like everybody can imagine a big uh, park or something, um, a big plot of natural vegetation. 
Each of these techniques can support a wide variety of ecosystem services. So um, these are services on the bottom that include nutrient cycling, uh, water quality, water retention, soil health, uh, natural pest control, um, and pollination. I just, this is the, I have to use this slide in like five different talks and this is the first time that I've seen pest control control. That's funny. Anyway, so all of these will um, feed into these services, which then will feed back into the diversified farming system, and it creates this kind of networked feedback loop. The service that I've been focusing on is pollination, and I've been particularly interested in looking at polyculture farming as a way to support um, pollinators. And really what I wanted to see was whether or not we can use this um, smaller scale, more local scale technique as a way to substitute for the benefits that we would get from these larger scale, more permanent diversification techniques like hedgerows and natural, land, or natural habitat that surrounds the farms. The reason that we were interested in crop diversity really came from learning about how a lot of our food is grown. A lot of farmers do not own their land anymore. A lot of them lease their land. A lot of them grow annual crops, and that means that where they grow today may not be where they grow next year. They bounce around a region like a game of chess. It's really fascinating to see the maps that farmers produce when they're trying to figure out where they're going to be next year. So an example of this is strawberry growers. Strawberry growers will plant and harvest in a single year, and they pull everything up at the end of the year and they go to another field that might be miles away from the site where they were that previous year. And the reason, some of the reasons for this um, are that they meet, strawberries um, are very susceptible to certain soil diseases, and those diseases will accumulate in the soil over time. So this helps prevent that, that disease accumulation. It also prevents certain uh, very catastrophic pests from overwintering. Um, and so when they're in a new area, they don't have to be subject to those things. So in these cases, if they're bouncing all over the place, why would a farmer invest in permanent modification um, to their fields, like putting in hedgerows, if they might not be back in that same spot for another 10 or 20 years? It just wouldn't make sense. So how do we turn land that needs to be productive into something that can also support pollinators? So that's why we were wanting to look at the crop diversity. We went to a region of California um, that is highly productive and also highly diverse as far as the landscape goes. So we're in the central coast, particularly the Salinas, uh, Watsonville, Santa Cruz growing region, where the majority of strawberries for the, the entire United States are grown. In this region, we can find areas of lots of natural habitat where there are farms. We can find areas where it's just a sea of agriculture. And we can find a lot of in-between. And so this was a great place and a very unique place where we could look at such a wide diversity of diversification. In fact, I ended up looking at all the different pollinator-dependent crops that there were, and all the way from the borders of Canada down through Mexico. And the only system that we could find that was ideal for the study was in the Central Coast and on strawberries. Because it's the only crop that we could find grown in monoculture settings and also as a part of polyculture farms, where there are farms that are surrounded by natural habitat and also farms that are in agriculturally intensive areas. Um, if you go to the Central Coast, for instance, or excuse me, the Central Valley, you can find lots of intensive agriculture but you can't find natural habitat anywhere. So we just couldn't make that comparison anywhere else. So in order to tease apart the local and landscape effects of diversification, we categorized two landscape contexts. We had those ag-intensive landscapes um, that consisted of less than 10% natural habitat within a one kilometer radius of the farm. That's all represented by the brown here in these circles. And then on the other side, we had the, uh, the complex landscapes where it had greater than 30% natural habitat. And some of my sites had over 90% natural habitat, as indicated by the green in these circles. 
And then within each of these landscape contexts, we looked at monoculture fields like this, where it was only strawberries that were grown on greater than 10 acres, and polyculture farms that had more than five crops grown within five acres. The farms could have been bigger than that, but that was um, a way to give us a measure of concentration of crop diversity. So you can see here, these are in very ag intensive settings versus uh, the farm boxes where there is natural habitat that's very close to farms. This allowed us to ask whether or not crop diversity at this local scale could provide as much benefit as a natural habitat that was surrounding the farm. We expected that we'd find the least amount of pollinators in the least diversified sites in these monocultures in an ag intensive area. We expected that we would find the most pollinators in polycultures that were surrounded by natural habitat. And then we expected that the, two, the middle two settings would be comparable if, poly, if polyculture could substitute for natural habitat. In order to find out um, who was there and in what kind of numbers, I sampled 17 field sites twice, once in the spring and once in the summer for pollinators. At each of these sites, I put out pan traps, which are basically little plastic bowls um, filled with soapy water. I put those out for five hours. Um, and then while those were sitting out, I took my net and I watched time transects and I caught anything that was visiting a strawberry flower. Then I took all those back to the lab, I pinned them, and I curated them, and then we sent those off to a specialist to ID, to ID them. Because with over 1,500 species of native bee, there is no way that I would become a good enough expert <laughs> to tell the difference between some of them. Okay, and these are our results, and I'm going to go over this graph with you now because I actually present this, a similar format uh, a lot of times. So here we have the different farm types. We have the monoculture farms in this line, we have the polyculture farms in this line, and those farm types are within each of those landscape contexts. So again, this is the ag intensive in the brown, and this is the um, complex landscape here in the green. The top panel is the mean abundance of native bees with their standard errors, and the bottom panel is the mean richness or the mean number of species that we found in each of these farm types. And what we found was that for abundance, both crop diversity and natural habitat increased the numbers of bees. Um, despite the landscape context, or rather in both of the landscape contexts, you can see that polyculture farms um, had significantly more bees than monoculture farms. And it's kind of hard to tell in this figure, but statistically, um, the farms that were surrounded by natural habitat had more bees than those that were not. We found a similar trend for the number of species that were present. We didn't find an effect of crop diversity, but we did find that farms that were surrounded by natural habitat had more types of bees than those that were in ag-intensive areas. The most interesting result was um, the question that we asked about substitution. We found that there was a positive, a significant positive interaction between polycultures in ag intensive fields. So in other words, this means that these polycultures that were in ag areas uh, had more native bees than monocultures that were surrounded by natural habitat. So what that means is that not only can polyculture substitute, in which case we would see those, those two dots next to each other, not only can it substitute for natural habitat, but it can exceed the benefits of natural habitat surrounding a farm, which is really exciting. So that's great. We know that there are more bees around. What the farmers care about, and what the rest of us should also care about, is whether or not the presence of those bees is going to increase our crop production. So in order to get an idea of how the bee abundance and richness influence the crop yield, I had to compare flowers, or fruits from flowers that were open to insect pollination to those where we had excluded them. Strawberries are also um, very good at getting pollinated by wind. And in Salinas, Watsonville, and Santa Cruz, those fields are so windy. So I had to produce two different types of exclusion bags. The one on the top, you can see, is this mesh that allows for wind to come through, but it keeps the pollinators out. 
and the one on the bottom, which is made out of either uh, cotton or polyester, didn't let the wind or the pollinators in. And what we found is that pollinators do significantly improve the fruit quality, which was a huge surprise to strawberry growers who know that strawberries are self-compatible um, and didn't think that they needed pollinators at all to get uh, production. <clears throat> so here we have malformation scores, which are basically, I went out and I looked at the fruits that were produced and if they had, the malformation scores were based on the number of blemishes or like the percent cover of blemishes. Um, and so here we have the mean malformation scores. The lower scores are better. It means less malformation, more perfect fruit. And the lowest scores that we found were for those that the berries had been open to pollinators. Um, so that indicated that pollinators are actually quite important for improving fruit quality. However, we did not find an effect of the landscape context or the crop diversity on fruit quality. In this case, um, I only looked at fruits that had been open to pollination, so that we could compare the pollination surfaces across the farm types. So again, we have the, uh, this is the mean malformation scores for monoculture and polyculture fields within each of the landscape context, and there was no significant difference between any of them across the farm types. And at first I was like, that doesn't make any sense. You know, we've got all these different bees that are in the polyculture sites. Why aren't we seeing the signal? We know that they help pollination. But that's because honeybees are everywhere. So this is showing you the abundance of honeybees across the farm types again. There are a lot of them. We had some fields, like the monocultures in the that are surrounded by natural habitat, that had up to 140 bees that I counted in one day versus the highest count of native bees was around 80, and even that was quite a stretch for the, for the native bees. So there are a lot of honeybees that are everywhere, and I think it's because of this that the signal of native bees is being flooded. What it does tell us, however, is that if the honeybee losses were to continue, those sites where the native bees aren't present are the ones that are going to be the most susceptible to crop losses. So in this particular study and case, this means that the monoculture farms are the most at risk, and polyculture farming can actually provide an insurance policy against the honeybee losses. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about what happened when I shared all of that same information with the agricultural community. I wasn't quite so naive to think that really all you have to do is just grow a lot of different crops. I knew from working on the farms that's something that's not easy to do um, in our industrialized system. However, I was still really excited that we made progress. Nobody else had looked at this as a way to support pollinators. Crop diversity had not been studied before. Um, and so we were really excited to get what we were hoping to find, which in science rarely happens, right? So. The thing is, is we, we know that diversification is good not just for pollinators, but for a whole slew of other ecosystem services. But when we look out there, we don't see that many diversified farms. Um, so what's the deal? Why, why, is agricultural, why is agriculture still so um, consolidated and industrial in this food system? When I started presenting this uh, the study to, to the growers that I worked with, but also at growers' meetings, I really got a mixed bag of reactions. Some people thought that the results that I had were cool, but, you know, especially if they didn't need pollinators, it wasn't that big of a deal, and pollinators certainly weren't their biggest concerns. Um, also, I learned that having a lot of farm, a lot of diversity on their farm, whether by means of crop diversity or non-crop diversity, was not an idyllic vision that was shared by a lot of the growers. Instead, when I would talk about diversifying, um, the response that I got was a lot of smirking, and a lot of scoffing, and a lot of skepticism. So I started to pay more attention to the stories that growers were telling me when I was out in the field and starting up conversations. And the one that I'm going to share with you now is one that really resonated with me and kind of shifted my whole framing of this situation. 
back in 2000, I think it was 11, we were looking for farm sites to start this study. And I met up with this guy from the USDA who was taking care of this long-term uh, experimental plot that they had out in Salinas. He was showing me all their crop diversification, you know, trying their, their insectary strips, and he had this hedgerow that had been in for, I think at that point it was around five or seven years. And he told me that he was having a problem with his neighbor, who we'll call Carlos. Carlos hated those hedgerows. And in fact, the last two years, Carlos had been practically demanding that the USDA pull the hedgerows out. And I was really confused. I was like, but hedgerows are so great. They bring in all these beneficial things. What's the problem? But Carlos found them a huge nuisance. And that's because the hedgerows were doing a good job. They were bringing in biodiversity. But they were bringing in birds that were going into Carlos's fields and eating his broccoli. Surprisingly, the issue was not that the birds were eating his product because his product loss was pretty small. The issue was that having birds present in his field increased the risk of food safety violations. And so the person, or the distributor um, that Carlos was contracted with was threatening to pull their contract and say, we're not going to buy your product anymore because your product is a, via, is a, is a um, food safety liability for our entire company. And so that was the moment where I was like, huh, you know, we, we ask people to do this diversifying, but it's not that simple. It's not always what we re recommend for management doesn't always uh, come with a straightforward answer. It's actually much more complicated than that. And also, this made me realize that, you know, we wanted to look at crop diversity because it was under farmer control. But there are a lot of other things out there that make it not really under farmer control. So I decided after talking enough to growers and getting enough of these mixed responses and learning that uh, pollination wasn't that big of a deal, I wanted to find out what was important to the growers. So the next time that I gave a talk to growers, which was uh, the last time was done in December in Cal Poly, I decided I would hand out a survey with a few questions on it, just to get an idea of the things that were important to them. And so for the next uh, several slides, I'm going to show you a summary of these uh, responses that I got. And I'll always, as you'll see, I'll always highlight the top responses in purple, just to sort of guide your attention to those. So I handed out about 100 surveys, and I got 43 back, which is actually quite a good um, response rate. This is just to show the demographics of the type of people that have responded. The majority of them were either pest control advisors or growers, or they identified as a combination of those two. But there were other agricultural industry representatives, and there were um, two academics that responded as well. I first asked what types of diversification had they seen being used or used themselves in the fields. Most people had seen or used cover crops. Um, hedgerows were also right there at the top. Crop diversity was up there, and also trap crops. Trap crops are those that, they're plants that are more attractive to pests than the target crop. And so they'll put these strips of these plants out either within the field or around the field to sort of draw the pests out of the crop. And then they can just either spray those trap crops or vacuum them or whatever they do to get rid of the pests. But it reduces the chemical usage within the fields themselves. Some of the other interesting answers that I got included um, that some people had seen either very little or none, no diversification. I found that really intriguing that uh, people who had sometimes 30 years of experience hadn't seen that much diversification, which tells you a lot about our food system. Um, and also somebody mentioned cultural diversity. On that really interesting. So then next I asked them what the motivations were for planting the diversification in the first place. The top motivations revolved basically around increasing natural pest control and improving the soil fertility and reducing soil erosion. Some of the other ones that I found that were interesting were um, there was a market demand for diverse products, 
one burr was required to grow multiple varieties based on his contract that he had with the company that was buying his produce. His produce. Mm. There was one grower who wanted to reduce, he wanted to increase natural pest control so that he could reduce the chemical usage. And the motivation was for that that they wanted to lower the exposure risk. They wanted to improve production costs. <coughs> Chemicals are expensive. Growers don't want to use them because they cost a lot of money. Um, and they also wanted to provide a cleaner product to, uh, to the general public. And then the last one I found really interesting too. This person said they, didn't, they couldn't afford um, and couldn't find enough labor to pull the weeds in their field, so they just left them. I asked whether the motivations had been met, and for the most part, they had. So the top answers uh, showed that mostly the natural pest control was increased, and that soil health was improved. Um, one person said that they were able to meet the market demands for providing diverse products, and one person said that they were able to extend their growing period. So in that case, it, was, um, it allowed them to be more productive. There were some negative effects that were mentioned, and that included um, the inadvertent attraction of pests and weeds, and uh, some reduced crop yield and issues with water usage. Given that most of the motivations had been met, I was kind of surprised to see that diversification wasn't as much or more of a priority for growers. In fact, 50% of the respondents said that it was either um, a priority or, or a prior priority to some extent. The other 50% said that it wasn't. Those that said that it was a priority said that it was only a priority for small and organic growers. Those that said that it wasn't a priority said that it was not a priority for large and conventional growers. So it kind of gives us an idea of who's thinking about diversifying and who's thinking that it's feasible. I got a lot of responses to this question of what are the challenges that exist to diversification. Um, the top ones that we found were increased production costs, increased labor requirements, which is a really big deal because we continue to feel labor shortages every year. Um, not surprisingly, food safety risks was at the top. And also not surprisingly, water constraints was right up there too. Other challenges included, um, again, that risk of attracting the pests and weeds, lack of knowledge and time for more complex uh, production systems, and the lack of available space for non-crop uh, production. So my final question was, okay, so now we know what the challenges are, how do we move past that? What kind of information and tools would be useful in order to help promote uh, diversification? And the top answers uh, revolved around more research evidence and proof of the benefits that exist and the, <coughs> and the economic gains that could be accomplished. Um, more education of not just the benefits, but also what to plant. Especially with hedgerows, I get asked all the time, I don't know the answer, so if you ask me this, I'm going to say I don't know. <laughs> but I get asked all the time, well, what plants should I plant for my hedgerow? And it's really context dependent. But people don't, they need to know some sort of description that they can follow, or else it's just not feasible. Um, and then also, not surprisingly, people had said that monetary incentives would help by means of grants or subsidies. And somebody mentioned having an insurance policy against losses that they might, um, they might encounter by, for trying to diversify. Other interesting responses included food safety policy reform, um, more time, uh, a consumer demand for these diverse products, and a cost-benefit analysis for different diversification strategies. So just to sum up really quickly, because I just gave you a lot of information, um, the types of diversification that people had seen were cover crops, hedgerows, um, polyculture, and trap cropping. The motivations behind that were to increase natural pest control and to improve soil health. Those motivations had been met 
yet diversification was only a priority for about 50% of the growers, and those were only the small growers, um, mostly because they perceived as too costly. The challenges that exist uh, to prevent diversification are production costs, labor shortages, food safety risks, and water constraints. And the tools that could be used or that are needed are research, education, and monetary incentives. I was really excited to get all of that information because it kind of gives me an idea of how we can move forward. We now have an idea of some of the obstacles that exist um, and some of the tools that are requested by the growers themselves to overcome those obstacles. So for me, even though pollinators are still very near and dear to my heart because they've consumed the bulk of my academic career in research, I, the one thing that I've taken away from this research is that I can't just focus on only one thing at a time. Um, and I certainly can't only consider the nature side of things. Agriculture is a mix of humans and nature. And there are a lot of drivers to the decisions that growers will make and we need to understand what those drivers are. Especially if we're gonna make any sort of practice recommendations, we need to analyze the ecosystems and the human experience together. And this brings me to my last slide that I have for you today, which is a conceptual framework for, um, for a grant proposal that we just submitted to the USDA. This is, this is my dream project. This is where I would love to take my work for the, in my 10-year plan. Um, basically, we would go back to the same region and we would look at 30 different farms, at least 30 if we could get that many growers on board with us. And we would look again at a range of diversification from none to a lot, very much like we had, I had shown you for the strawberry pollination. But the difference is that instead of focusing only on, on pollinators, we would look at a whole range of biodiversity. And that would include pollinators, it would include pests, natural enemies to pests, and soil microbes even. Um, then we can see how the diversification itself and also that biodiversity influences those ecosystem services. And so the ecosystem services that we would measure would also be a range. We would look at pollination, but we would also look at natural pest control. We would look at natural disease control. We would look at nutrient cycling, um, water quality, and air quality regulation, including carbon sequestration on these farms. We could then see how this, those ecosystem services fed into the economic performance of the farms. Um, and we could do a cost a cost, right, cost benefit analysis of those different diversification techniques, which is exactly what one of those people, what one of the respondents had asked for, which is amazing. Um, and we could, in, so we could get an idea, of, well, how much do all of these different things cost? Is it cost effective? Can we find a place where you can improve um, the environment and also make money still? And then finally, we would include um, interviews to get an idea of the growers' perceptions and their experiences with diversifying and um, receiving these ecosystem services. Because this is going to really drive the choices that they make for the diversification techniques that they use on the farm. So what I'm hoping is that this whole systems approach will help us identify the most pressing barriers that exist and we can then start to focus our energy and our future efforts on breaking those barriers down. And I know it's going to be tough. Sometimes I even think it's going to be impossible. But I know that we have to make very major systemic changes to our current food system. And that's the only way that we're going to save not only the bees, but also all the other biodiversity that's needed in order to sustain um, our future food production. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you.
similarities I have you have you seen them before. Um, and I'm wondering, I you know this is a little away from your area, but are, are butterflies basically just considered pets? Do they compete for food resources or I mean I've never heard of them considered as pollinators, but um, so what's what's the deal with that area of biodiversity? Okay, could I, would you like me to repeat the question at all? Okay, so basically your question is, well, you made the comment that you don't see as many uh, butterflies as you used to, and you're wondering whether or not they're considered pest species. Actually, butterflies, they are pollinators. They are considered decent pollinators. Um, butterflies, when they come to flowers, they have these really long legs, right? So they often don't touch, most of the body doesn't touch the pollen to transfer. So they're not often considered very effective pollinators. They only transfer pollen that basically gets stuck to their tongues. Um, but they are pollinators, and they do add to the diversity of pollinators that exist. There are also, um, I think it's, they're usually moths, although the cabbage, the cabbage moth is a butterfly, and that is a pest. So it's, it's a lot like, you know, with these bees, bees are very charismatic, they're always seen as good, and I think they mostly are, um, but there are also a lot of other insects out there, like flies, even the most economically devastating pest for strawberries is the ligus bug, and I would see those ligus bugs in the flowers, and even though they're huge pests, they're doing a good job of pollinating when they're out there, right? So, including butterflies and even the pest species, it's not like they go out there with intent to be good or bad, but the way that they interact with flowers can be both beneficial and detrimental. And I think the decline that we're seeing is not so much because they're seen as pests, but because a lot of their, um, same thing, their food and nesting resources are being diminished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a really good question. So the question is, what difference does it make if birds are in the field? Why is that a food safety risk, right? It's actually really crazy. <laughs> um, so the Food Safety Modernization Act was passed back in 2011, and it's recently now starting to become more implemented. And there are a lot of practices um, that have to change in order to meet those regulations. One of them is that if a bird flies overhead and poops in a field, the farmer has to identify where they pooped and they draw a one meter radius around that and they have to cut out all of their product. That's insane. That's insane. I totally agree with you. And if you are a small farmer and you only have two acres, that's a lot of product that you can lose, especially if it's a high value crop like berries. So, I know. <laughs> um, it's all crops currently. It's not crop specific at this point. No. So, why did the government do this? I mean, they Well, not living in Manhattan that think that, you know, bugs. So, okay, I think a lot of what happened with this food safety issue, and especially in the Salinas and Wasserville area where people are very hypersensitive to it, is back in 2007, um, there was an E. coli outbreak. I think it was E. coli in spinach. I don't know if you remember this. It was really like the first mainstream media um, you know, food safety outbreak. And that completely changed the industry for leafy greens. They started the leafy greens modern the leafy greens modernization act. Leafy greens, I can't remember now. I'm getting it mixed up. But in any case, it started. It wasn't a it wasn't a federal regulation, but it was something that became a standard in the industry. And it's continued throughout, and we continue to have these food safety scares, which really I think are a product of how our food is grown. So. In particular, when we think about lettuces, and so this, or you know, baby broccoli or baby greens or anything, where if a bird poops in there, this could be a problem. Uh, frogs are a real problem. Mice, anything that could get picked up with machines. What happens is that 
you will have some, somebody like Earthbound Organics, which is a, a big company, but they don't have, it's not like Earthbound is out there farming a million acres of land. They're contracting with, you know, over a hundred different growers. And then those growers grow the product and it all goes to a centralized distribution center where it's washed and it's packaged together, right? So you could get a bag of spinach, baby, baby spinach, that might have product from 15 different farms in it. And so it's becoming a lot more sensitive if, if one person has an issue with food safety, it can contaminate um, a whole lot of product and they can't trace it back. And so the entire industry gets hit hard by it. Um, and so that's why everyone is so hyper aware. And I agree that it's insane, and I agree that we should have some more, maybe uh, some deciphering between the different crops and how things are grown and how things are processed if they're not sent to a big distribution center, for instance. And there is a little bit of that that's going on, but they're still trying to, to heal it out and figure it out. Did I answer your question? I feel like I just went on a big rant about yes. food safety. <laughs> you did, and it's just, it makes things look much more disturbing for me on an industrial level because the way I look at the whole thing is very simple. You're wearing a sweater, you take a pair of scissors, and you snip the up. You lose the birds, you lose the bees, and the whole sweater starts unraveling. And, and, and I'm just kind of questioning the people that are in position of decision-making, are they only looking for a very, very focused lens than are they missing the bigger picture that is really much more harmful than, than the bird group on the spinach? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think, you know, there are a lot of um, competing interests, too. So you have some, you know, some regulations that are saying, well, we need to make sure that we don't have this risk of diversity on farms. But then we have other regulations that are saying, well, we need to improve diversity in these ways or save, you know, threatened species, and so they compete. And this is why it comes back to my, my issue with just going to farmers and talking about pollination. It comes down to growers are being yelled at by all these different people with all these different causes, and they have to listen to the one that's going to affect them the most. In most cases, if, if I don't do this, what is going to be my biggest fine, you know? What is going to reduce my production the most? And that's where they start. And I agree. Um, if we start taking away the diversity, then we have a whole slew of problems. And in fact, after that spinach scare, people had been putting hedgerows in. And after that spinach scare, through the entire area, they all got ripped out. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, if our area completely colony collapse uh, business, I just thought, I, since you're in this area, you know, I asked, I mean, it almost seems embarrassing to me that we can't figure out what's going on here. Geez, I have a friend that has been eating bees for, for maybe 20 years, and he just, in this local area, he just had to give up. Too many colonies were dying, it just wasn't protected anymore. And the price of honey is going up, and, and yet, we still don't seem to have any good ideas about yeah, that's the magic question, isn't it? What's the what's the real cause of colony collapse disorder? And uh, you know, there are always we keep coming up with new things, new suspects that we can point a finger to. Um, and again, coming back to paralleling them, the honeybees with humans. It's like when we have an ailment. And we think, oh, if we take this one pill, then it's going to solve everything. We're going to find the one problem. But our bodies don't work like that. Our organs don't work separately. Everything works together. And so often it's a, a result of a combination of things that aren't working in our bodies. And so we have to make a holistic shift in order to fix that. I think it's the same with the honeybees, honestly. It's complicated. And it's frustrating because it's complicated. And it's not just one thing that's causing it. Um, it's a combination of being exposed to pesticides and perhaps even particular pesticides, which we're trying to figure out too. Um, it could be an interaction of certain pesticides, and that's impossible to figure out. Um, it's the stress, it's the parasites, it's the poor diets, 
It's all of these things. All of it works for us, too. We're overworked, we're overtired, and we're not eating well, and it's causing us as a whole, and the society as a whole, to suffer from that. So I agree, it's frustrating. Yeah. I'll go ahead and take it, and I'll go to you next. You know, I that's a good question. Could everybody hear that? He asked about basically the competition. That example that I gave with the honeybees and the and the bobs. It, you know, what why is it that they're starting to move move more quickly and become agitated? I think that it, it might be a competition thing. When I'm out there in the fields and I see when I see this happen, you know, a bee will come and land on a flower. It might be that there's a great flower that has good resources and there's a bee that's already on it, and so another one's like, hey, that looks like a good spot to eat for me too. I'm gonna get in there myself. And so then the bees go and then they fly off, right? Whereas if the other bee had not come along, it would have just stayed there happily eating. And I think so there is some element of competition. Um, but there are definitely enough for resources that that they're okay for the new bees to be there and it's not gonna be hurting the native or the honeybees at all. But I think it's just, you know, when there are more people in a room, you just aren't always comfortable. Um, and so, in that case, I don't know if it's chemical, or if it's just a physical thing, or, or what, but I do know that it's effective. Okay, I'll do you, and then... What do you think happens? Well, no, I'm wondering, has anybody done any research to just kind of follow up theoretically what are we looking at? Just yeah. Looking, looking at the crop, looking at the, the web connectivity of that crop, whether it's the land, people, I mean, it's relevant. Has anybody researched that or not? Um, I don't know if there have been particular studies that have looked explicitly at if you were to remove the honeybees. We can make really educated guesses, though, by quantifying how much the honeybees are providing a service and by seeing how many other native bees are out there as an alternative. Almonds are a really tough system. Um, they're really tough because they bloom so early. Uh, you know, that's, it's winter still when they're blooming. And a lot of bees are still sleeping. So honeybees, I think honeybees are even pretty sleepy too, but because they're starving, because they've been overwintering, um, they're pretty productive. So for almonds, if we didn't have the honeybees at this point, we know that there are not enough alternatives um, in those same fields in the type of production system that we currently have. The way that almonds are produced is in there, intentionally there is no other vegetative diversity because uh, the nuts fall on the ground and they have to be picked up off the ground. So you can't have a lot of stuff in the rows in between. It just doesn't work for production in that way. Um, so currently, the way that almonds are grown, it doesn't support lots of other alternatives that exist. So if there were a situation where we start losing the honeybees more or they become too expensive, um, the crops are going to suffer. And in fact, just this February, there was an article that came out in the newspaper saying, again, record-breaking losses. And the problem is for is mostly for those earlier in the spring. Because bee stocks, they're managed, right? So they can, they can bee keepers can put more energy, more investment into rebuilding those stocks. But for the first harvest, the first springs, they can't do it in time. So the almond growers are the ones that are suffering. And this article that I read, they come out of Baker's Field, and they were freaking out. The almond growers were freaking out because the bees just weren't there. They had over 30% loss again this year, and even if people could get their hands on honeybees, um, they were so expensive, too. So it is a real issue. It, 
it really is becoming a more real issue, especially for those crops that are so dependent and are grown in such an intensive way that the alternatives are not there yet. Yeah. I had two small questions. I was wondering what the ratio was between on your agricultural plot versus a complex plot. What's the native to brought in bee ratio? The native to the what bee? Like you bring in honeybees or you bring in something that wasn't already there. What's what's that ratio? Because it seems like your diversity would be more a measure of native spe numbers, native species, which would be not just the one bee you brought in or something like a honeybee. Right. So. I want to make sure that I'm understanding your question. Well, I mean, in your, in your plots from your data that you had, I was just curious what the, on, on the different uh, farms you looked at, how many native bees did they have compared to how many bees, if they brought some in, did they have? Right, compared to the honeybees. Yeah. The ratio of native bees to the honeybees on those farms. Um, well, so the honeybees were mostly the same across all the different farm types, and there were a lot of them, over 100 in that one day. The ratio differed for the different farm types. In the uh, monoculture fields that were surrounded by intensive agriculture, there were some fields that I counted either zero or only two native bees there that day. Um, so in that case, the ratio is very high, or very low, right? One, so like one native bee to 50 honeybees. Basically, um, and in the in the polyculture fields, um, I had the average, so the mean, the mean was around 80. But there were some fields that I went to, and I had over 200 native bees caught in one field. Um, so even and, besides, so an agricultural field that has poly crops, that would have more native bees. The agricultural field that has pollinated crops? Uh, multiple types of crops. That would have more native bees, you're saying? Yes, than absolutely. Crops. So the, the diversified farms that had more crops had a lot more native bees um, than those that did not, by far. But they also had more numbers of bees. They had the same number of honeybees. Yeah, so but the actual abundance of bees was higher. The abundance of bees was higher for those. The, the types of bees didn't differ between the polyculture sites and the monoculture sites. So that was the diversity. There was more diversity in those that were surrounded by natural habitat, um, but not necessarily more diversity for those fields that were, um, that had more crop diversity. Yeah. There were a lot of, um, a lot of the native bees that I caught came from a few dominant species. Um, so in that case, I think, too, it helps. The natural habitat is important because it provides a long-term nesting spot for a variety of species, especially the rare species. Whereas when we have the um, annual fields with the polycultures, they might, it's, it might not be enough time for them to establish and for the rare species to find their way to those fields. So that might be why the um, natural habitat is affecting the diversity, but not the crop diversity itself. But the abundance, it definitely draws them in and supports them. And then also if you have a honeybee, you have a queen bee in the big hive, uh -huh. are all the other bees male and couldn't sting you or is that is that completely not the case? So if you have in a hive, the workers are, um, oh it's so complicated with honeybees versus bumblebees. The workers are I want to say they're females. For sure with bumblebees, the workers are females. Um, with bumblebees, the new queen emerges in the spring, she makes a nest, and the first broods uh, that hatch are, they, they turn into females. This is actually really crazy that I learned about bumblebees. Bumblebee workers that are females that don't mate with males will still lay eggs and produce viable offspring. Right? That's crazy. But they're haploid. So the babies that come from those are only males. But if they mate with another male and they have fertilized eggs, they'll produce females. So they have two sets of genes, the diploids. Um, but yes, yeah, so the workers will be uh, females, I'm pretty sure, 
and they will be more aggressive if their nest is disturbed. But out foraging, they're not, they don't tend to be um, very aggressive, especially honeybees because they'll die after one sting. All the other native bees can keep stinging, um, but especially the honeybees. Yeah. Any other questions? Great, thank you.